Hey, what's up? This is your girl Diamond. I am here at the Trans Summit, the very first day um, of the summit in Los Angeles, California. This summit is about including the transgender voice in faith, any kind of religious organization to be inclusive and to, you know, include the LGBT community in that faith because we are God loving. We are loving people who are faith and spiritual, um, you know, we do have a spirituality. Some of us have this on our hearts. So some of us are called, some of us are, you know, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, whatever denomination, whatever sector, we want to come together and bring forth the voice for the trans community within the religious aspect of our lives. So one of the speakers is, um, she was on the um, logo show, um, Beautiful Daughters. Her name is Valerie Spencer. Welcome to the Trans Faith Summit. And know that you really are that. You are welcome here. Now, I'm not ready. I'm not warning. As you may have been able to tell a little bit, there is another event, Unity Fellowship Teleconvocation, that is happening at the same time that our Trans Summit is. For some of you, you have seen holy rolling praise on television. Well, welcome. <laughs> if you see a chair flying through the air, don't call security. <laughs> if you see people rolling in the aisles and kicking the carpet, don't dial 911. <laughs> You have just stepped briefly into what I call the Pentecostal worship experience. Yes. And as for myself, this is my birthplace. I was born and raised in the Unity Fellowship movement. Not to do a commercial, but it's just the truth. This is my birthplace, this is my hospital, this is my trauma center. Come on, I see you, you, this is my birthplace. This is my birthplace, and I will always be a daughter of it. It is true. I am a new thought metaphysician. I'm one of those Shirley MacLaine meditate out on the bush kind of people. <laughs> And I love to sit in the silence and listen to the allness of God. Matter of fact, can you engage me for, can we take a collective breath together? One more, it's free. The breath is the first thing you will ever do in the human experience. Come on, and it's yeah. the last thing that you will ever yeah. do. Is we as a Israel? 
So that was not news to me. You know, my pastor's the big old sister. She said to me, but my pastor says to me that he wears pink pumps and teardrop earrings. There's no unity, OGs and Alpha. I'm trying to scan Unity, OG. You were a baby, baby. That ain't no OG. I'm talking about Unity, OG. The beauty all of OG. And I said, well, they should seek him. For saying that he was busy on the microphone. Well, that's a sin. How they gonna do that? How they gonna have abomination on the thing? I have to go and see what this is about. And I went and I felt the love that was tangible in the room. It was like people wanted me to be there and weren't asking me what was my birth name and what's the fish name and what's the boy name and did you have the cutting snip and did you get the fish I love it. 
But way back when gay wasn't so gay and friendly, sure wasn't friendly when you had the Archbishop. Yeah. Now, you are thinking, well, you know, we always been doing this work, not in black communities. That's right. Humor me for a minute. That's right. Our lyric about the spiritual experience in black community, we had a name, Valerie Spencer, comma, abomination. Valerie spends the comma going to hell. So I just thought, well, let me just smoke weed and have as much penis as I can get a hold of. <laughs> this. This is the most loving, inclusive place that I've been thus far, as far as like a group. It was, it's, it's organized, it's comfortable, and it's all in an environment of love and faith and all different types of faiths and religion coming together. And it was so powerful today. Yesterday was the introduction. Today, was the meat and potatoes of what we were supposed to be here for. One of the um, presenters, Miss Major, she's like 69, trans woman. And she really hit the ball, you know, out the park when she said, sweetheart, where we are now is so different than how it was when I was growing up. You know, we have a full and lavish history of people that are pioneers that you don't even know about as a trans woman. She was like, we used to run from the police. Now, you know, we expect the police to help us and it could be possible that they are there to help us. It used to be where they were not, the police were not the help. They were the enemy when somebody was doing us wrong. They were the enemy. You know, so we would be running, jumping over cars, climbing fences and hills and wigs, trying to not go to jail because of what we were trying to be. She was like, just the fact that this weekend, this really, this got me emotional to think of the struggles that she has been all through. Cause I can only imagine I grew up in, you know, the nineties and two thousands. So growing up in that era, I can only imagine what she went through. And she was saying that the fact that she can go to the airport in her heels, her dress, her hair, and be herself and be true to herself, go to the airport and they call her ma'am and be respectful, come to a hotel and sleep peacefully as a woman and come to a group of trans folk, men and women, and full of this love, the fact that this is possible and in a safe place was so far from the imagination back when she was growing up. You know, and she said, you have to understand and know that we have a lavish history that we need to share with people, respect the people that come before you, and know that you that you have been passed a torch. Regardless if you want it or not, you have been passed a torch, and you know, it's your chance to do something with it for people that's 40 years from now, 50 years from now. And it was powerful, powerful, powerful. And then we had a F to M, 
man, Mr. Green, come up. And he spoke about how the FTM community is kind of outside, you know, unseen and unspoken of and talked about, you know, because, you know, first of all, the M to F that all this training, pornography, putting them in the forefront of the mind and escorting all this. So you hear, you see them on more. You don't hear, is this a man or woman show featuring F to M's. You see that featuring M to F's. Um, you know what I'm saying? Because it's kind of like we have the female thing going. You know, females get more attention than men anyway. You know, get more attention than men because of the body parts and, you know, the objectifying of women. So, he talks about how we have to be inclusive. That is trans people, not just trans women, not just trans men. We have to tell all our stories because we have a story. And this just was a powerful day. I was deeply honored to be asked to be with you today and to speak with you today. And when Bishop and Beverly and Shannon, my brother, <laughs> spoke to me about what I ought to talk to you all about today. Um, you know, Bishop hadn't met me. And I know there are a lot of you out there who haven't met me. And there's a lot of you out there who have no idea who I am or what 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 is that guy doing here? And um, it, it, I told them my story on the phone, and they said, "Well, share your story, share your story." And so I, I will tell you a little bit uh, about how I got to be here. I was born in Oakland, California, in 1948, and I was born with a female body. Mm. My parents were very happy to have a little girl, and they really wanted a little girl. And I was not exactly um, cutting the mustard. <laughs> when I was very young, I uh, well, I should say too, my family was very is very Northern European, um, English, Irish, Scandinavian, and Dutch. Um, I got the, the short Scandinavian, English, Irish part. The Dutch people are very tall. <laughs> There's other people in my family are tall, not me. Um, we come from a, a line of farming people and lumber people. Very working class people. Uh, my father was, was very, very, very bright and loved human beings. He was a salesman. He sold furniture. He started his working career in a, in a lumber mill making boxes when he was 13 years old. And he eventually worked his way up and started selling the furniture that the mill made. And uh, he loved people and he loved different languages and he loved learning about different faith traditions and he loved reading. And, and he could talk to you about anything you wanted to talk about. If it interested you, it interested him. And it, and some people thought, well, that's you know that's the trait of a salesman. You get to get inside people. You can talk to them about anything. But yeah, it was it is something. It is a trick that salespeople use. But the fact is, for him, he really meant it. He learned a number of different languages. We lived in a uh, well. We were I was raised in a Presbyterian Protestant back uh, background. We were one of the few Protestant families in a Catholic neighborhood. My father, in, in the furniture business, in furniture sales, was predominantly a Jewish business. And so my dad had a yarmulke, and he went to all his friends' bar, mitz bar mitzvahs for their kids, and he could speak Hebrew and Yiddish, and and people often thought that that he was also Jewish and that he had changed his name from Greenstein to Green, but no, it's it's really green because it's English Irish. So very, very interested in people and, and wanting to see what made people tick. And I, when I was young, was different. And people people laughed at me because they couldn't tell what sex I was. So even though my parents dressed me up as a girl and tried to make me learn how to behave like a girl, 
my energy was male. I was like a boy in a dress. And people would look at me, even when I was four, five, six years old, and say, when I'm wearing a dress, mind you, and say, are you a boy or a girl? Well, I knew I had a female body. I knew I was supposed to say I was a girl. And yet I knew what it was that people were picking up in me because I was not comfortable in that dress. And I didn't know what to do with that. And we went to church. And in the church, I learned that there's a place for men and a place for women, but there was no place for me. Come on now. Ha. Come on. So I went outside in my yard and I made up my own religion. And I had a sun and a moon and a tree and the grass on the ground. And I had the water that came from the sky and I had the warm earth. And those things were with me all the time. And when the breeze would come through the grass or through the trees, I knew I was not alone. And when the sun walked with me every step of the way from my house to my school, I knew I was not alone. Mm. And when I looked up in the sky at, at night and saw the stars and the moon, I knew I was not alone. And I knew that those people who laughed at me one day they'd be sorry because I felt that I knew something that they didn't know yet. I didn't know what it was. I honestly didn't know what it was. So I struggled. I struggled through all of the identity label things and I struggled through, you know, my parents wanted me to get an education so I went to college. I still didn't fit in. I, by the time I was in college in the, in the early mid-60s, I uh, came up with a word for myself that I was cross-gendered. That was the only thing I could think of, because my gender and my body didn't match. So I was cross-gendered. I thought I was the only one. And um, in the mid-70s, I figured out that I wasn't the only one, that there were other people out there. And that it might even be possible to actually change my body so that my spirit could be seen. For me, it was important to change my body so that my spirit could be seen. That was ultimately the finding of balance inside me. Now, before I got to that place, which I started my transition in 1988, just before I turned 40, um, I was in a relationship with a woman and we had decided to have children. So, and she was a lesbian and she, she didn't want to have any men in her life. So when we first gotten together in 1975, she goes, I want to have children. And I'm like, well, how can you do that if, you, if you're with me? Because I can't get you pregnant. And she goes, well, I know. Well, there will be a way. I can do this. There will be a way to do this. And by, you know, about 10 years later, they had sperm banks. And so we went to the sperm bank and we picked out a donor that resembled me. And I inseminated her. And we eventually, it took a while, <laughs> eventually uh, had a, a fantastic little baby girl. And we wanted to have another child. So about four years in between, and while we were in the process of conceiving and she was incubating uh, the entity that turned out to be our son, um, I basically hit the wall in terms of how do I live with myself and can I do I really need to change my body do I want to change my body how can I grapple with this reality that I live in and become whole in myself 
and I realized that I couldn't ask my children to carry the, the dichotomy that I carried. That I couldn't have an honest relationship with my children unless I changed. Because I didn't think they could see me the way I was. Now maybe that was not a, not a good projection to lay on, to, to imagine on them. I think my children are immensely talented, creative, intelligent, wonderful young people. They're 25 and 21 now. And they are spectacular young human beings. But I was scared. I was scared. And I did change my body, and I have to say that it was the very best thing that I have done for myself. Instead of worrying about what other people were thinking, it's all the all the battles that I had to go through getting to that place, worrying about what other people were going to think, constantly taking care of how other people were interpreting my gender. Now I don't have to worry about that anymore. Now I thought I was going to go out and get my sex changed and I was going to go home and mow my lawn. I thought this was, I was still going to be me. I still had this child with the sun and the moon and the trees and the wind. I still had all that with me. And I would just go on and everything would be fine because I was myself and balanced and together now. But no. <laughs> that isn't the way it is. That isn't the way it works. I was called. I was called by the the breaking of a promise. I was called by being abandoned by my partner and having my children taken from me. I was called to mend my broken heart by seeing the pain that my trans brothers and sisters were experiencing. I was isolated I was building a career, I was building a family, I had lots of friends, very few of them were trans, until after I transitioned. Afterward, this world, you people, you people are the deepest, bravest, most real people huh. in the world. And you all deserve to be loved and to applaud yourselves and to hold on to that truth that is inside of you. I don't care if you change your body. That doesn't matter. I don't care if you take hormones. That doesn't matter. Those are personal choices that each one of us needs to make. But we all, in our gender variance, however that is manifested, deserve to be ourselves. And so I began to fight for civil rights and civil protections and legislative change and institutional change and education about trans people. And particularly to bring the story of trans men into the foreground because trans men are so invisible in this world. Even in the trans world, we are often unseen and unspoken for. You're welcome. Thank you. It has been my pleasure to do this. It has been my honor to do this and to try to create a space for trans men to find community with each other and to learn to speak their own truth themselves, not to give it over to somebody else. It's not, it's not me. It's not about me. It's about opening the door and letting everyone come through. It's about opening the door and letting everyone come through. Amen. Amen. 
One of the good things that I've learned about this whole movement, and this movement is called the Unity Fellowship Church Movement. Um, and one of the models, just so you can get an idea of what they're about is, one of the models is God is love and love is for everyone. And that is one of the key principles of this movement is that it's, if you're a religious person, it is inclusive of all people, all races, all genders, all ethnicities, all denominations, everything that you believe we all can come together and fellowship in unity no matter what you believe you know you don't even have to believe in a faith but you just want the love of fellowshipping with other human beings come and enjoy the service or if you are a deep rooted christian or kojic or whatever denomination you are you still can come and feast at the table of your fellow uh, your fellow human beings you know and really you know praise god and you know Thank God for life and stuff like that. It's really all about the unity of everybody. No matter what gender you are, what sexual or orientation you are. There's not that misogynistic hierarchy. You know, men can only be in the pulpit. Um, women are supposed to be sitting in the church on the usher board. All that kind of stuff. It's none of that stuff. It's just all about the love and the uplifting, that positive energy, whoever it is to you, whether that be the creator, if you're a naturalist, if whatever you are, all coming together and worshiping in one place. Unity fellowship movement, church movement. It was just amazing. So, if this was a such, I hope you guys can make it. The next one will be in Charlotte. Whatever you need to do next year in July, um, make it. And this is such a powerful experience. So, um, got a lot of footage, got a lot of stuff. So, check it out. Hit the links throughout the video. And um, I hope I see you guys there next year. I will be there. <laughs>